Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you would, take your Bibles today and turn to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6. We're going to look at something that's very, very, very important with God. The Bible's very clear. That which is uh, highly esteemed amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. And it goes in reverse. That which God esteems is often an abomination to men. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find it. Let's hope for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings and your truths. Father, we pray now that you'd bless this message, that it would uh, put seed out to bring people to saving faith, that it would encourage and edify Christians and help them to be faithful and true. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And right in this verse of scriptures, we see the division between God and men. Men are enamored with pride and men like to boast and and, and men like to think themselves to be the God of the universe when all they are is men. In fact, there's a man that's coming that will be just a man that will think he's God. And he's called the Antichrist. We've had kings and despots that have gone to their head and they believed that they were gods. And the Egyptians uh, worshipped their leaders as gods. Uh, you find it in the Greek culture. You find it in a lot of cultures. You find it in Roman uh, deities. Uh, uh, Nero went insane. Men are crippled by their pride. So the propensity for man is to proclaim his own goodness. I'm wonderful. But who can find a faithful man? And it's a lot more difficult to be faithful. But being faithful is what God's looking for. The faithful man is strong in the Lord. Thou therefore, my son, be thou strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's God's grace that allows us to be faithful. Paul had an infirmity of the flesh, and he'd asked the Lord that it would depart from him. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient for us to run the race. And we'll stumble and we'll fall, but if we're humble, we'll get up and outlast them all. That's what God's looking for. Faithfulness. Now, it's very good to tell a man that he must learn to be strong in the Lord. But it's even better to tell them how to be strong in the Lord. God has most important information here. Stand still. Before you go around trying to be Christian wonderful and reverend wonderful, stop for a minute and put your eyes on God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. When a Christian gives up being his own God and honors the true and living God. When he'll stand still and put on Christ, then he can walk in the Spirit and glorify his Father in heaven. Every Christian needs to spend quality time with the Lord in study, in prayer, to get a handle on life and God's priority is life. I was just talking with a lady of our church, and actually that's why I was late, because I was dealing with this very issue, tonight's message, and I personally love the brethren. I will do anything I can to help the brethren, but I find a lot of the brethren are very shallow when it comes to knowing God and his truth, and a lot of the brethren speak and say all kinds of things that are not correct with God. They often greatly err in not knowing the scriptures, and nor do they know the power of God. And you need to know God and his power, not the imaginations of the brethren. Now, I love the brethren, and we should always love the brethren. God would have us to love the brethren. In fact, we are noted to the world in how we love our brethren. What you need, I need, every Christian needs more than anything else is quality time with God. Time in the scriptures, in prayer and meditation, to learn the scriptures as God would reveal them in spirit and truth. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A real wise man, and most people looking for wisdom, what to do, how to get out of trouble. Well, real wisdom is the wisdom to keep you from getting in trouble. 
real wisdom will put you in a position where you don't need wisdom to save you. Because you're in the right path. It's not wise to keep your distance from God. But God would have you draw nigh to him. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, when I preach a verse like this and teach a verse like this, I wish I was a good singer because it brings to my mind taps. Most people do not know the words that go to the taps. They just hear the bugle cry in the distance. But it ends something like, day is done, gone the sun, from the rocks, from the hills. And it ends just with, God is nigh. It should put you in a spirit of soul searching, scripture searching, and searching for God in his word. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the truth. A lot of Christians today are extremely double-minded. They praise God and live for the devil. And God wants you to be with him. I give you a recommendation. Before you open God's word, stop all our activities and remove all the distractions. Give the Lord your full attention. Be still and consciously enter into the presence of the Savior. Submit yourselves to God. Look on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not rush into his presence, but enter reverently and boldly in the presence of the great King of Kings. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. When you have your heart right with God and when you love God you will not care what other people think the world poets once wrote a song when a man loves a woman and something in the song says of the fact that if his best friend tries to put her down he'll distance himself from him and not hear her that's the way God would have you be towards him if you really love him, if you really know him, and you know his righteousness, the world cannot intimidate you to forsake him. But see, the issue is, do you really love him? Have you really drawn nigh? Have you heard his words? Have they reached into your soul and captured it? Look on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not rush into his presence, but enter reverently and boldly. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Now, understanding is a relationship of things, and people don't understand simple words that have great impact on life. Wisdom is the choice of law of the land. It's taking the best means. There's more than one way a lot of times to do certain things. There's only one best way. Understanding the relationship of things. And what's most important and what people don't understand is the relationship of life and God and his presence and how God looks at life compared to how we look at life. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God setteth upon the throne of his holiness. Holiness is a very hard concept to really get a hold of as an unholy sinner. I'm glad you're saved if you're a Christian. I'm glad you've been washed in the blood. But that doesn't change your character. That forgives you for your lack of character. What changes your character is to put on Christ and walk in the Spirit. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. A spiritual relationship with God is not drudgery as the flesh would have you to believe or should it be a dread God is not trying to rain on your parade and take away your joy quite on the contrary God is trying to protect you from yourself 
show you his way and the truth that you might have joy and you might have it more abundantly that your heart would be filled with peace and, and glory that people don't understand <clears throat> let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords most men spend too much time with the issues of this life rather than the author of life. As a consequence, they neglected time with the Lord. They fail in their unrighteous mammon and cannot receive the true riches of this life and the life to come. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than children of life. Folks, you want to face this. You'll find that the wealth of this world belongs to the worldlings far more than it does to Christians. They are wiser in their generation than we are. And I say unto you, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Now that wisdom of God, God's wisdom, God told me through those scriptures to be prudent in my deportment has saved me in these latter days of my time. Betrayed by a wicked man because I practiced God's truth years past. God enabled me to stand and receive the blessings that I believe are coming. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. If you can't take care of your finances, how could God trust you with the true riches? A lot of Christians have messed up financial lives. That's for kids, folks. If you can't handle your finances, you can't handle the real truth of life. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And friends, I've sad to say this. And it might be you, brother. It might be useless. You're not reading your Bible. You're not spending quality time with God. You're not walking in the Spirit. You're not handling your affairs discreetly. You're not being what God would have you to be, and God's not going to be able to give you the true riches because you can't handle the worldly riches. Because many Christian men are not faithful to God in their personal devotion. They do not handle the mammon of unrighteousness correctly. In their failure to handle the mammon of unrighteousness correctly, they disqualify themselves from receiving the true riches of life. And that's a great shame. Because the issue is not money. The issue is, do you have the money, or does the money have you? And today in America, most people got to have it. So the money has that. If therefore you've not been faithful in non-righteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who should give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either you hate the one and love the other, or he will out hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. God's got to come first. You put God first, but seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added on to you. You cannot handle the mammon of unrighteousness correctly until you seek the kingdom of God first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow should take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Read and study the word of God, that you get to know him as you should know him that you may set your affairs in proper order. The exhortation is, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You know, the last days they will not endure sound doctrine, sound truth, sound teaching. The only glory worth glorying in is knowing the Lord. It's one of my favorite passages in the Word of God. There was a time when this was all over our church. I had preached it to the people. This is a heart that loves the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Now 
God's made the wisdom of this world not. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. You want to really see strength? I know it was just a young person that didn't know a lot, but I, I know what they were trying to get across. And I was at an athletic event, and I'd like to find one of these shirts because it had a picture of Christ on the cross being crucified. And it said, if you think you're strong, try pressing in. The sins of the whole world. God can carry the sins of the whole world. His strength is innumerable, unlimited. His strength is for the soul, not for the body. If you walk with God, you can walk through anything. You can endure anything. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Boy, I tell you what, money can fly away off the cliff. There's a many a person that was wealthy today and broke tomorrow. I remember the um, years ago when I was a young kid, Sonny and Cher, they were a uh, singing duet, and they were very popular. And I remember listening to an interview, and uh, Cher was very distraught. Her and her husband, through being singers, had put a million dollars cash in the bank. A million dollars, real cash. And he invested it in an adventure and lost it all. Riches make wings and fly away. And she was so upset. A million bucks. Gone. But let him glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Do I know what God delights in? You want to see things from God's viewpoint? Loving kindness. Do you know how much better this world would be if people could just be loving kindly to each other? Judgment. If people had sound judgment, that they made wise decisions, that they chose wisely according to godly wisdom in the choice of law will end, or that they would bring judgment upon the unjust in, in, in righteousness, righteousness in the earth, doing right, do the right thing, just do it. The people fail, and that's why you all need a Savior. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, for there's none righteous, no, not one, not even me. You need a Savior. Your pride's going to send you to hell. Not your sins. Your pride's going to send you to hell, not your sins. Somebody already paid the penalty for your sin. Your pride's what's going to keep you from accepting the payment. Read the Word of God thoughtfully and carefully. Meditate. Turn it over in your mind. Let your heart embrace it. Plan to read the scriptures with some sequence. Read a passage of God's word thoroughly, a minimum every day, something. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Again, I was talking with this Christian, and they were telling me how when they first got saved, they just read and devoured the word of God, and that's exactly what happened with me. I got saved, and I started reading that Bible. I read the whole Bible through, probably in less than a month. It was just, I couldn't get enough of it. Where I used to come home from work and 7 o'clock, I'd be turning on TV and probably watch that till 11 or 12 o'clock and go to bed. I'd come home and I'd open up my Bible and I'd read it from 6 o'clock to midnight. Just read it. Read it, read it, and read it. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And boy, I tell you, it saved me from a lot of deception of ignorant Christians giving me uh, advice from their own imaginations that would have destroyed my life. Because God's word sustains us. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. God's word will never let you down. It's better to read a short, short passage well than to read a long passage with little comprehension. Go verse by verse and meditate. Cross-reference. Read the text in the context. Read the verse before, the verse afterwards. See what it's really saying. I 
I've had hundreds of Christians give me a verse, ripped right out of its context to make a pretext. And what I do as a Christian pastor, I take the context and answer them. I answer the fool in your father. That's not what the Bible is teaching. Read the verse before, read the verse afterwards. Read the whole chapter. Be saved. Here's God's admonition. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whatsoever thou goest. Every Christian should understand that this world will work against you to keep you from meditating on God's word because it will in time make you strong in the Lord and the devil doesn't want that. It will give you strength and courage to obey his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear God's word, the more you read God's word, the stronger and greater your faith will be. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. But if you'll let God build your faith and lead you in faith, You'll become pleasing to God, and God will bless you and reward you in this life, in the life to come. Godliness is profitable in this life and in the life to come. Every Christian should understand that this world will work against you. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? You know that's the standard case today. Most Christians come to church, they want entertainment. They want to be pacified rather than have revelation and edification. That's the world today. They're cumbered about with much serving. And then they're envious and they're upset with those that are spending their time with the Lord. Bitter, therefore, that she helped me. And Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary had chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She wanted a personal, in-depth relationship with God. Mary put her heart and mind to her Savior. And that's what was needful. Not Martha's cleaning of the house. Now houses need to be cleaned, and things need to be upkept. But minimal and at the appropriate time, God needs to have the preeminence. When he has the preeminence, then your life will shine. After reading the passage and ask the question, what is God saying to me? Think on that which you've just read and meditate on what God has said to you through his word. Learn how to rightly divide the word. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly divide in the word of truth. Don't take other people's mail. You see, if you read the Bible, it's written to different people. Now, if you want to know what's almost always to you and what is your doctrine today for church, uh, born-again church members in the, in the body of Christ, Romans to Hebrews, read the Pauline epistles. Those, those apply to you almost all. Other scripture verses, doctrine apply to the Jew and to the Gentile, but you might be able to apply them to yourself spiritually. You might have an application for them historically. There's a doctrinal application to every scripture there's a spiritual application to every scripture there's a historical application to every scripture but doctrine has to be first doctrine is what people are not following today and they rest the scriptures to their own destruction in the last days they will not endure sound doctrine and that's where I find the brother in one thing God's revelation to us demands a response his word is to be acted upon. The purpose of knowing the scriptures and not obtaining knowledge, but to glorify God by living in obedience to his will. There's a certain sect, group of Christians, very zealous for the Lord. But they cause some of the biggest problems in the body of Christ today. You want to know why? They are heavily indoctrinated in the word of God. But here's the problem. Knowledge puffeth up. Charity edifies. They don't have the charity to go with the knowledge, and therefore they become dangerous. 
It's not enough to know the book. You've got to know the author of the book. You've got to have a personal relationship with God so you'll have his grace, you'll have his mercy, you'll have his truth, you'll have his righteousness, and you won't make a fool out of yourself by being zealously afflicted to improper conduct. A faithful man will always stand faithful during hardships. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Probably the most difficult duty of a soldier is to take up a rear guard action. It's very humility, humiliating and it's quite fatal. Usually what's happened is leadership has positioned the army into a bad situation. And the army has to, to save itself, has to withdraw. And the only way the army can withdraw without suffering immense casualties and even being defeated is to set up a rear guard. And they volunteer some folks to die. And they say, okay, you, and you, and you, and you're going to set up a perimeter here, and you're going to stay there, and you're going to fight, and you're not going to let them be able to attack our rear as we get out of here. You are to stay there, and you are to die if you have to, but you have to let the army get out. That's called enduring hardness. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it every once in a while. It's called martyrdom. Thou therefore endure hardness. It's called taking up a cross. You know what's wrong with Christian today? They won't bear the cross. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? world go free. Oh, there's a cross for all to own, and there's a cross for me. You have your cross, Christian? I don't see many Christians bearing a cross today. They're not enduring hardness as a good soldier. They don't know how to fight the fight of faith. They don't know how to move as an army of God. We sung that song today, Onward Christian Soldier. And a faithful man, a faithful man is a soldier. A soldier is a man that's committed to the government to support and sustain that government with an inward willingness to sustain it in times of peace and war through personal sacrifice, enduring hardships for the sake of that government. We are to be arguing for the prerogative of Christ and his government to come. That you would walk worthy of God who have called you unto his kingdom and his glory different government than the world. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You read that book, and you believe that book. The only thing in the world that will change you is from out of this world. It's a supernatural Bible. We were talking about that a little while ago. You can't change anybody. I can't change you. You can't change me. I was talking about how foolish people are when they get married. They meet somebody. They like somebody, but they're not suitable for them, and they think, well, I'll marry them, and I'll change them. That's a, that's a sure divorce coming. I went to a wedding one time, and uh, the groom wasn't behaving properly, and there was this, always a big, fat lady, and she had to make her comment. She'll, she'll straighten him out when she gets him home. There was this young little filly marrying this foolish old foolish guy. And it's like, no, she made a bad choice. D-I-V-O-R-C-E. Sad, sad, that bitter. But you can't tell anybody in whom they came in. They won't listen to God, they won't listen to you. That you would walk worthy of God who has called you into his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. You know what? A, you know one of the blessings of being a Christian besides having peace is joy. I got that joy, joy, joy down in my heart, down in my heart. You, you, you can't fake that, can you? If you got it, people will see it. If you don't have it, nobody can see it. That comes from God, God alone. 
People think they have joy when they have happiness. That's not joy. It's not the same thing. I have a lot of fun. You can go buy a roller coaster ticket, and you can have a lot of fun. But when the roller coaster ends, gloom, despair, and agony comes back. Joy dispels that. Joy is in the soul. Joy comes from God. Oliver Cromwell, going back to soldiers. And this is a very important statement he made to a man that was a warrior. He was a Christian. You know what he said? He said a strange thing. He said, the best ambassador is a man of war. You know why that is? Because a man of war doesn't want to fight a war. He's tasted it. But he's not afraid of it. And he'll do right because it's right to do, because only right will deliver him from that war that he doesn't want to fight, and if he has to fight, he'll fight that war right. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is that. You committed to a war a spiritual war. It's not using the weapons of this world, but it's a war against the flesh and the world system and the devil. It's a war that fights for your possession of your body, and you're to submit it to Christ and walk in the Spirit. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. The world does not remember or give much credit to Oliver Cromwell, as it should be because he was most likely a saved Christian. In history, Cromwell belongs to a very elite group of generals that never lost a military battle in his life and was in the right cause, perhaps maybe the wrong way. For the Christian, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. But there's times that God's people have had to fight carnal wars. The greatest general of all was Joshua, never lost a battle. Cromwell never lost a battle. But they were following Jehovah. And they were following God. You want to be victorious? Jesus Christ will give you the victory. But you got to follow him wholeheartedly. You're going to have to be a good soldier. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and <clears throat> every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can change people's direction with the word of God. You can change people's life with the word of God. You can't do anything on your own. But God can. What most people understand about the military is its ability to break, destroy, and kill during a time of war. What many people fail to understand is that armies of antiquity often constructed major projects for the good of the nation in Rome. The bridges and aqueducts of Rome were often built by the legions of Rome. Every Roman soldier that carried a gladius also carried a shovel. Then said Jesus on disciples, if any will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Will you pick up the cross? Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange of his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with the angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. I'll tell you, I have a lot of regrets in my life. I have never regretted the night I got on my knees and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I'll never regret that to the day of my death, and the day of my death, there will be a hallelujah, I'm glad I'm saved. Where works have nothing to do with a Christian salvation, works have everything to do with the Christian life. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus on the good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The Christian primary work, 
as an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ is to convert the lost to Jesus Christ and live a holy life for the Lord. Brother, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide multitudes of sin. I've had the privilege to lead numerous people to Christ. How many, I don't know. God knows. Some probably didn't get saved, and some probably got saved that I wasn't aware of. In fact, blessings come. I was visiting a certain uh, hospital, a rehabilitation center, and one night I was in the elevator. I can't even remember who was with me. It might have been my son or my wife. I was visiting somebody, and this woman and her husband got out of the elevator and said, Oh, hi, Pastor Berkeley. She said, I got saved at your church. I said, Really? I didn't even know who she was. I never could even, if you just said, who is she? Thank God Mary didn't say, who is she? <laughs> I couldn't have told you who she was. But she remembered where she got saved in the church that I pastored. And I thank God for that. That's a sinner that's been saved from death. To convert is to change from one state to another. as to convert a barren waste into a fruitful field. That's what God can do for your life. To convert a wilderness into a garden, that's what God can do for your life. To convert pagans to Christians, that's what God can do for your life. To change or turn from one faith to another faith. To turn from a bad life to a good one, that's what God can do for your life. To change the heart and moral character from an enmity to God and from uh, a vicious habit to the love of God and the holy life, that's what God can do for your life. David was in great sin. And he prayed a prayer, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. God blessed David and forgave him. My grace is sufficient. And David could go on, repenting of his sin. A faithful man refuses to be entangled in the world system. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Christians will need to pay attention to the cares of this world where legitimate and necessary debts and bills are concerned for life. A soldier whose manner of life is different from civilians of this world, he must deal with the cares of this world in an appropriate manner that's pleasing to his government. I mean, even soldiers that are supported by the state still have to live in the world for their families and their wives and their children and have medical care and get groceries and things like that. And you do as a Christian but you need to have God's principles sustain you, doing things God's way. And there's a grave responsibility to the Christian. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were coming, I was again teaching an individual I had Christians that advised me that I wasn't living by faith because in my early ministry I had a good job. Boy, I'll tell you, Christians can be simple. One individual just went and said, you know, when are you going to quit your job and live by faith? And I'm a founding pastor of a very small church and a very small congregation. <clears throat> and the Bible said the labor is worthy of his hire, and I thought I needed a little hire. Then another brother thought it would be so much I'd be so much more humbling if I'd quit my good job and take a lesser job so I could just prove to him I was humble. The wisdom of men. If I'd listen to them, I'd be in a difficult situation today. But I listened to God and his word and his truth. I saw the Apostle Paul with supernatural sign gifts laboring, laboring throughout his entire ministry. A Christian man has a great responsibility, and this is what guided me as a father and a husband. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. God says if a man doesn't take care of the needs of his family, doesn't supply their earthly needs, doesn't take care of the needs of his wife, he's worse than an infidel and he's denied the faith of God. A Christian husband has responsibilities in regards to this world. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. I once had a young man, and I've told this a hundred times, if not two hundred times, came to this church, 
and a wife and three little baby kids. And I went and paid the standard uh, visit. When people come to the church, I went and visited them. And I got to where they lived. It was very deplorable conditions. There was feces on the, uh, in the environment. Uh, it stunk. And uh, they were asking me if I could get them some food and help them with some things. And I said, well, have you thought about getting a job? And he said, oh, the Holy Spirit hasn't led me to get a job yet. I said, that's so. Is that really the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible already tells you you worship an infidel and value of faith. You need to get a job. I said, if you get a job, I'll help you out until you get a job. But if you're not going to get a job, I can't help you out. They didn't want my help. He didn't want to get a job. He hadn't been led to get one. But the scriptures already said that he was an infidel and denied the faith. A faithful man will not become entangled with the world. You know what Christians miss it? They get they work too hard, too long for too much, and lose God. You gotta have a moderation. You don't need all that overtime. You don't have to have two cars. God was very good to me. I had one job, and I supported my entire family with that job. And I even got out of that job and took an early retirement and cut my salary in a third, actually two-thirds, seriously, so I could serve God. And God met all my needs. I like to tell people how God took care of me. It's only God. I've been to England and to France. I've been to Nigeria. I've been to Israel. I've been to Guatemala. I've been to Puerto Rico. I've been to 48 states. I've been to Hawaii three times. And less than 10% of that I paid for. God took care of me. So how's that happen? I don't know. God just worked in a mysterious way. But he's worked. I've seen it. You can't live by folly. I worked all the time. I was faithful all the time. Many men proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful man who can find You've got to be right with God. You've got to be right with your family. You've got to be right with right, and then God will make it even righter. God's not like this government. There's no welfare with God. But he works for your welfare if you will follow him. So this is the will of God. People always say, what's the will of God for my life? What's the will of God for my life? Should I be the president? I don't think so. Well, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the loss of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, this separation from the world is often violated by Satan, leading Lord's people into a marriage relationship with the world in either physical or spiritual relationships. And you're called to come out of it. Be ye not equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Beal? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be a separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I remember how God took care of me at work in my workplace, because I witnessed to everybody I worked with, and, and they all knew I was a minister, and they all saw my life and the conduct, and then they had between what was called the MOC, or the Mini Computer Operations Center, and my department, which was the Mini Computer Repair Center, and we maintained the MOC. And by the way, we put in the multiplexers in Syracuse that uh, Al Gore said he invented when he invented the internet, but we installed them. And they said to me, they said, George, we like you, and we have, every year we have this big party once a year, and we'd like you to come and bring your wife and family. And we know that you don't approve of our conduct after a period of time. So why don't you come and, and, and eat with us and fellowship with us uh, for an hour or two and we start misbehaving then you could go home. And it worked out wonderful. You see, I know how to be friendly and I know how to get away from the world. They even knew how to instruct me to get away from them because they knew my positions. It's not hard to be a Christian. 
You just need to know that you can walk down the right road with anybody until they start walking down the wrong road and you've got to keep on the right road. That's not hard. And what concord hath Christ with Baal? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you're a temple of the living God. And that God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be a shepherd, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God's good and God's true. God's looking for you to be faithful too. Because he's faithful to us. A faithful man seeks to please Jesus Christ in all. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. There is nothing more important for a Christian than his personal relationship with the Lord. Many Christians are holier than thou. Many Christians are difficult to live with. But the Bible says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Not by being a scourge and twisted. And by fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And I've seen God turn my enemies into my friends. This is a general truth that's subject to time and judgment, but most of our tribulation comes from doing things wrong rather than from persecutions for righteousness. I said, most of the troubles that Christians have have from doing things at the wrong time, in the wrong way, in the wrong place, rather than their supposed being persecuted. If you came to my house and opened up my refrigerator and I don't drink, but if I had a beverage in my house that was legal but not more, and you decided to take it out and dump it down the drain, I'd say, excuse me, who do you think you are? This is my house and my property. This is not your house or your property. And Chris said, well, they're in sin. They may be in sin, and you may want to lead them out of sin, but you don't have any right to go into their house and violate their rights. Be an example. Don't have any of that stuff in your house. When they come to your house and open up your refrigerator, let them see good things. And in your life, well, again, working with my cohorts, when they found out that I gave up alcoholic beverages, I haven't had an alcoholic beverage since I was 24, because I gave them up for the Lord and His glory, and I don't drink beer anymore. I'll cover that in a minute. But, um, my friend said, well, you just haven't had enough temptation. And when we were in New York City working, and they decided to take me out to dinner one night. They bought my dinner. I know. And they bought all these drinks. They bought everything. They had all the drinks all over the table. And they thought I was going to just melt. But I don't do urine anymore. You see, what most people don't realize is what alcohol is. You get these little, little animals, animals, and they chew up the yeast, and they swallow it, uh, and I'm over-illustrating how these little uh, amoebas, protozoids, whatever they call them, they ingest and digest, and they <coughs> and that's your alcohol. It's the excrement from little creatures that people drink that cause them to go insane. I don't do urine anymore. Have a nice day. God bless. I just told you the truth. I didn't tell you. I just told you the truth. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Saves a lot of money. Saves a lot of heartache. Keeps you from a lot of divorces. Really help your life. This is a general truth that's subject to time and judgment. Most of our tribulation comes from doing wrong rather than persecution. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till afterward. Many Christians are teaching other Christians that it's all right to compromise sound doctrine. 
to win souls. That's not right. Then others are teaching young Christians to offend without wisdom or discretion. That's not right. Both extremes are wrong, and they both become sin because we're not trying to do right by God and win the lost legally and lawfully. Very simple. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Churches a lot of times try to steal other church members. Therefore, him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. But boy, will they try to justify themselves when the mission of every church is to go out and win the lost, not proselytize the saved. Paul taught young Christians with milk because they could not bear strong meat. How much more are those blinded by Satan? And I, brethren, could not speak on you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. People can't take strong meat anymore. Why you can give babies with milk? And that's the problem with the church today. It's filled with babies. There's no soldiers. God, we need some soldiers. We need some men and some ladies. There are many truths of the scriptures that should be taught by God's people to the lost until people are saved, that they may not hinder the work of the Lord, but rather help it. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to acknowledging the truth, and they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him in his will. Let me give you an example. Christian giving is a privilege and a responsibility for Christians that should never be denied, but it should never be placed on television and taught to an unbelieving world unless the lost should believe that our interest is in their wealth rather than their soul. I taught a message this morning on tithing. It dealt with the tithing of souls. And it needs to be taught. It's the truth of God's word. But televangelists are teaching the world in the most despicable way. You can't buy God. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns the universe. You can't buy him with his gold. man's foolish. On the other hand, but this I say, he which sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. And he which sow bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. When we take up an offering here, we do something a little unique. I picked it up from another brother. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, so we'll take up our offering, and I'll bring this to the attention, that God loves a cheerful giver, and then we'll all say, hurrah! That's a good way to give your tithe. If you love the Lord, you ought to be happy about it. I get a lot of fun out of it. Better say hurrah than oh my. When dealing with lost people, God's word shows to us the issues we are to deal with first, then dealing with lost men about salvation. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The Holy Spirit was active in Paul's witnessing. That's why Felix trembled. The major issue that Paul took to the lost were righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message not being preached today. People don't get saved by asking Jesus in their heart. You get saved by repentance and faith. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says your sins and iniquity have separated you from God and he will not hear. Until you repent, until you turn from unbelief to belief, from false belief to true belief, 
from your self-righteousness to God's righteousness, you, you will not be saved. You must be born again. It's a spiritual birth when you repent and you put your faith in the shed blood of Christ. Again, I was talking with a Christian today, and I said, what is the shortest thing that you could say going to heaven and why are you getting to hell? And I tell you, many people can think of a lot of things, but this is what I'm saying. If I'm standing at heaven's door and God says, George, why should I let you in? I'm going to say, the blood. The blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. The blood of Christ. That's why I'm going to heaven. God did something for me. A sinner. You should not deal with other issues of sound doctrine that you are taught in this church until you reach the loss of the gospel first. They don't need to know about the ten toes in Daniel's revelation. They need to know about salvation in Christ. When you get them saved, then you can teach them all the rest. But sanctify. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You ought to be able to tell them why you believe, what you believe, how you believe, where you believe. You ought to have a testimony. A faithful man will always strive to be lawful in obeying God's word. And if any man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. You can't get ahead with God by cutting corners, pushing the envelope, and false dealing. We should never ever seek to offend the lost, neither should we ever deny the truth of God's word. Today, there's a group of Christians that pride themselves on offending people. We've seen some obnoxious conduct. One group, God, I don't know why, was going to the funerals of military soldiers and mocking and, and upsetting, just insane. Do you think homosexuality is a sin? God poured fire on Sodom and God will judge America for its sodomites. And sodomy is an abomination in the sight of God. But what's that got to do with a fallen soldier? I have no idea. I happen to have a son in the military and I wouldn't appreciate Christians coming to my son's funeral if he fell in battle to defend their liberty to be obnoxious fools. I don't know what's going on with Christians today. They're certainly missing grace. But I'm here on this television to tell you if you're into sodomy and you refuse to repent from that sin and put your faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. But it's no more grievous than adultery. But it's grievous. It's just more perverse. It's unnatural. Remember that Paul's ministry was of a different nature than the pastor of a local church. I'm ahead of myself. Whether therefore ye, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, or back to doing things lawfully, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense. Don't be obnoxious. Be truthful. Be bold. But don't be brash. Neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Your motivation ought to be for God's glory and soul salvation. Now, don't be silent. Don't be a secret witness. Be bold and be brave. But be gracious and godly. Be legal and lawful. Many immature Christians lifted up with pride fall in combination with the devil when they through pride, envy, and strife preach Christ with premeditated contention. 
Not a novice being lifted up with pride, he fall in the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which were out, lest he fall in reproach and the snare of the devil. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you should have a good testimony. Whether you're the pastor of the church or sitting on the back pew, everyone's a minister for the gospel of Christ. Everyone's to be a witness. Everyone's to testify. Everyone should be able to give an answer to the hope that's within them. Remember the, that Paul's ministry was of a different nature. And so a pastor's was a different nature. But we all have the same ministry to the lost. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach, here it is, Christ even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. Preach Christ of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing that affliction to my bonds. They made it harder for Paul. They made Paul suffer more. But the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel, they had greater success. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul was just happy the gospel was getting out. Whether it was baby, immature Christians doing it in the wrong way, God was, Paul was still happy. The message was getting out. The lost didn't know it. But Paul recommends to do it in love and righteousness. There is never a legitimate reason to compromise or embellish the truth of God's word. Never a reason. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from, the, from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. A faithful man will continue so laboring for the Lord in season and out of season until the time of his departure. So the charge to the minister of the gospel of Christ and to every Christian also in their ministry, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead as is appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Paul was a soldier. He fought. In the Civil War, the North had a very, very impressive boy general. He started out as a second lieutenant and from battlefield commissions he ended up to be a brigadier general in a very short time. His name was George Armstrong Custer. You know how he got that? He fought. They gave him command and he attacked and he attacked and he attacked and he attacked and they kept giving him command and he kept attacking and he kept winning because he was a fighter. God wants Christians spiritually to be fighters. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but we're to be soldiers. A faithful man commits the word of God to other faithful men before he departs. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. So how about you, friend? You want to be a soldier? A soldier of the cross? Can you pick up the cross and bear it? Can you walk the walk? Can you talk the talk? Before you even think of it, you need to get saved. If you're not saved, you must be born again. If you're born again, then come and follow us. If you're not saved, come to church. We'll take the Bible and show how to trust Christ. We'll show how to be saved. And you can join the fight. You can fight for the right and the true and the good. You come.